your program. Welcome once again to The Simple Truth. We're in the book of Hebrews, and we're doing a study on that book all the way through it. We're now in, in actually chapter 5, but I want to start at uh, chapter 4, verse 14. So if you'll get your Bibles out and follow along, take notes. That way you can go back and read it for yourself, or you can go back and check the notes and put them so you get a better understanding for it. Uh, the idea is that what God has for me to do to teach um, it is to be taught to others. And so as his anointing comes, um, be willing to step out. Um, I know when I first started teaching the Word, uh, I didn't know much. Uh, and my phrase is that a box of rocks knew more than me. But after uh, some 35 years of doing this, uh, I give you the praise for the not on TV, but on Bible studies and things. I give God the praise for it. He's the one that gives you the wisdom and the boldness to, to follow through and uh, the revelation of what the word means when you dig into it and, and see what, what it really is saying. Uh, uh, I've got some good commentaries. I've got some you know, good, good messages I've heard in the past, and, and I put all those things together. Uh, plus, just listening to God speak to us, uh, to get the revelation of what he's saying to us. And, and his word will do that for you if you'll take the time to seek him. And that, I, I'm finding in my walk that even now, after this long period of time, <clears throat> that seeking him every day is very important. Being in the word every day, even if it's just for uh, maybe three, four verses and think about them all day long. You, you find that that is so helpful to you. Um, and then make sure you're in a good Bible-believing church that loves the Lord and is preaching His Word uh, and, and outdoing. Uh, we need to be in that, in that working stage too. Not that it saves us to be working, but it is showing our faith through those works. Now, let's start at verse 14, chapter 4, verse 14 of the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> See then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confessions. So notice he's saying, the writer of Hebrews is saying to us, we have such a great high priest that that has gone through many of the things that we have, been tempted by, by the things we have, and yet never sinned. There's not one of us can say that we've been able to do that. Not before we met Jesus, anyway. <clears throat> and that we need to hold fast to this confession. And the confession that we have is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus died for our sins and shed His blood and rose again. And we all put that to what God was doing for salvation, and that is our confession. And we are to hold on to that fast. And we're not to be swayed from it. We're not to be lax in it. We are to be steadfast and excited about that confession. Now, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize uh, with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Notice that he's been tempted with everything, um, kind of things that happened to us, um, and yet he overcame them. Yet without sin, he overcame those temptations. He was able not to um, activate those temptations. Uh, so I've talked to people that think, well, if I'm being tempted, then I'm sinning. No, the, the temptation is not a sin. We're all going to be tempted. It is when we allow that temptation to act out, that's when it becomes sin. It's when we act on it. So don't act on any temptations. Uh, seek out the Lord and, and to give you uh, the way to 
overcome that particular area of your life. Uh, <clears throat> it's been said, if, you know, uh, when we get into a place like that, if the door is closed, look for a window because he will provide a way for us to escape from those kind of traps that come into our lives. Um, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne room, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Notice that if we are tempted, that we can come to the throne room and not crawl in or, or be shy about it or, or to feel like uh, I'm not really supposed to be here. But when we come into the throne room in prayer, being humble, but not be, but not be afraid, we can come in with boldness, he says. We can come in knowing very well that we're going to get answers. Now, I want you to understand, sometimes them answers is not the one that we went in for, but it's the one we need. Because God's wisdom is far higher than ours. Uh, we, we need to know that, that, that we can go in boldly, but we also need to be willing to accept what He has given us so that we can overcome every temptation. Not just some, but every one of them. So um, be willing to, to come boldly into the, where we will find mercy. We won't find judgment. We'll find mercy and we'll find grace to help in a time of need. And it's not just in the time of need that we need to go boldly in the throne room. We need to go boldly in the throne room every day and to, to make our petitions to God uh, on things that are happening, not only in our own lives, but in those of others, those around us, uh, family especially, friends especially. But even those who do not know who Christ is, they need it more than anyone. And we can still boldly go in and say, Lord, this person needs to be saved. Let your Holy Spirit work on them and draw them closer because we know what God's will is in this area, that all should be saved. Now, not all are going to be saved, but it's God's will that all would be saved. So we need to be willing to tell them and pray for them. Uh, and, and I've seen it work in my own life uh, where the church was praying for a person and they got and that person got saved. And as a matter of fact, they didn't come to our church. They went to another church, but they got saved. And that's what we're all about. It's about people being saved. Now, chapter 5. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Now, <clears throat> for High priests of the Old Testament, they were taken from among men, and not from just any tribe, but from Levi. Uh, high priests were sons of Aaron, and grandsons, and, and on down the lineage. Uh, but Aaron was anointed with oil, but all the rest was anointed when he was, and carried that anointing on through. Uh, so we understand that... that um, the reason we need uh, a high priest that would be offering gifts and sacrifices. Let's talk about the gifts and sacrifice. Gifts are things that are not, um, the blood has not been let for. In other words, it is, it is for grain, a meal, uh, oil, those kinds of offerings that's made to the Lord uh, without the shedding of blood. The sacrifices are those that where the blood is shed for their uh, sins. Uh, but it depends on, you know, but both was being offered at the time. Uh, verse 2, he can, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. Now, let's go back to the first part of that. Uh, the reason he had to be a man, he had to be one who, who comprehended 
the same kind of misery, the same kind of trials, the same kind of, uh, of, of people that, that, that he was uh, ministering for and realize they were ministering, the high priest of that time of man was ministering to God for the people. Uh, and yet he had to minister for himself. He had to have a sacrifice for himself because he was not, how can I put this? He was not completely saved. He still had problems. He still had uh, uh, things going on in his life. Uh, you see, the law in the Old Testament was, was only showing us what sin was and giving us a picture uh, of what Christ would do. But he himself, the high priest of the old, through Aaron, was all sinners like you and I were and was because of the part of mankind. Uh, when it comes into uh, verse 4, it says, No man is given this honor. No man can call himself to high priest. I want you to understand that, that true ministers of God are not called by that person. They are called by God. Uh, it is the, the calling that's on our lives. Uh, Teaching is, is a calling on my life. Um, a few months ago, uh, also uh, pastoring a church. But right now, the, the main calling is teaching. But there's others who their main calling is to be a pastor. And there's others that has a main calling of being evangelist. That doesn't mean they can't be a pastor or a teacher, but that the main thrust of what God has called them to do is that particular area. And so we, we learn those things, sometimes the hard way, but we learn those things that God is doing those things through us because He's called us, just as Aaron was called. Aaron did not, well, when Aaron was called to be a high priest, there was no high priest. Uh, the, there was no law yet in existence as far as the Mosaic law. Uh, God told Moses to make Aaron, a high priest. Uh, Aaron didn't ask for it, but he got it, okay? Um, we, we need to be careful that we don't try to call ourselves into something instead of allowing God call us into things and to the right things. He's the one that's placing us in the very positions we need to be. If you ever come to the point where you think that you're in the wrong position and yet you believe God called you there, you're not in the wrong position, all right, let's go on. Verse 5, So also Christ did not glorify Himself to become high priest, but it was He who said to Him, You are My Son, today I have begotten you. As He also said in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, notice who's, who's talking here um, from these verses. I give these verses. Um, verse 5, You are My Son, uh, today I have gotten you. Uh, that is God the Father speaking of the Son. I have appointed you to the priesthood. Now, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But then again, he says, you are a priest forever. Notice that the high priests that are men, they are high priests for a certain period of time. And usually when they died, then a new high priest would be appointed. But here, Christ, though He died once, is alive forever. He will not die again. He is going to be our high priest forever. And that's because it's in the order of Melchizedek. I mean, it was not of the order uh, of the way the law was set up. Because Melchizedek was again before the law, of Moses, but <clears throat> and not of the tribe of Levi, which Christ also was not a part of the tribe of Levi. Uh, he was part of Judah, came out of that line, and there's never been a high priest that come out of that line except Jesus. And that's because he was appointed by God to be a high priest forever. Now, let's go on. Verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplication with 
uh, vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. It was heard because of his godly fear. Through, okay, let's go on. Through him was a son, yet he learned uh, obedience by the things which he suffered. Notice in these two verses that even though Jesus was a son of the God, he had to learn obedience and patience in the days that he was on this earth in flesh and blood. And yet in that he offered up prayers and supplication for the people, even to the point of crying. And, and, and it kind of takes us to the Garden of Gethsemane where, where Jesus was in such stress about what was about to happen to him that he even sweated blood. Okay, And still, uh, when he asked to take his cup away from me, meaning if there's some other way we can do this without going to the cross and, and giving my life, uh, and yet, no, this was the way it was planned. This is the way it's going to be. And then he said, not my will, your will. And many times, folks, I want you to understand that when we go into ministry, <laughs> we have to say, Lord, not my will, but your will. Uh, and you'll find yourself going to places that you never dreamed you would go. But it's always for a purpose. It's all part of God's plan. And God wants you to be faithful in those plans. And even Jesus had to learn uh, while he was in his flesh what it was to be like for a man for mankind to be in this world. I don't want to leave the ladies out because ladies, you go through this too. Uh, but one thing he had, uh, he had a fear of God. And that fear is not, not afraid of, but reverence for. He had such great honor for, a great appreciation for who God is. And that his desire was to please God, the Father, in such a way that it would be pleasing to him. And so he was doing those things in faith. Now, verse 9, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him. Called by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Notice he said in verse 9, um, and having been perfected, yep, at maturity, uh, completeness, that Jesus became the author of eternal life, or eternal salvation, eternal life, to all those who obey him. Boy, that's where we, we miss it at times. First of all, let's talk about... The, Jesus was obedient to the Father in everything. What, what he heard the Father say, that's what he said. What he seen his Father doing, that's what he did. Uh, he did those things in faith, trusting the Father all the way. Uh, they are in unity, completeness. They're one-on-one -on -one and, and totally in line with one another. And then he comes back. Because of that, he is the author of our salvation. He is the one that wrote it for us. He is the one that, that gives it to us. But we are the ones who must obey Him. We must obey Christ. I want you to understand, folks, it is not just when we meet Jesus at the cross that we're saved. We are saved then, but not completely. And to quit at the cross is, is not taking into account what the Word teaches us. And that is we are to go from glory to glory, from victory to victory. We are to continue to learn. We are to continue to do. Uh, if we all just sat around the foot of the cross and said, we're saved and didn't do anything, we'd be in trouble because we haven't grown anything. We've never matured from being a babe in the faith to being mature to lead others. And that the whole thing here of being obedient daily of, of going on. And yet I have met people who said, well, I got saved when I was 12 and I don't have any more worries. 
Well, yeah, but you got to be doing something too. You got to be a part of this grace that God has given us. And so uh, he tells us in verse 11 uh, that this is, these are hard things to understand because you quit listening. You're dull of hearing. You quit listening. You no longer take it to heart. It just kind of goes in one ear and out the other type idea here. We need to take it important of what the Word is saying to us and what God is doing in our lives to continue. And that's the way our salvation is day to day. We're working it out. Uh, and sometimes in fear of, of what's going to happen next. But it is always worth it. There's not a better plan than the plan God has for you. There's not a better plan of salvation than through Christ Jesus. Verse 12, For through this, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone in, to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of dull age. That is, those who by reason of the use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, he's, he's, he's using the principle of a babe and a full-grown adult. Uh, here when he talks to a, a baby needs milk because they can't take you know, solid foods yet. Their little bodies aren't, aren't fully developed so they can do that. But he's saying that, that, that when you are a babe, when you are very young spiritually, but you've stayed that way. You never grow up. You, you need to continue to grow. You need to get off of the milk and get onto the solid food, the, the deeper things of God, you might say. And he's saying, you, you have to move on from the cross. You have to grow. You have to study the Word. You have to seek. And, and this is the main, main idea that, that God is, is, is putting on us today is, is that we are to be seeking Him continually. Yes, we can look back to the cross and say, thank you, Lord, that, that you saved me and you forgave me my sins, but it doesn't stop there. We have to continue to seek Him. There's a whole lot more than just getting saved at the cross. That's a great day. And it's a great day to remember, but it's not a day that we can live in. It's yesterday to us now, and we need to move on to the future. And he's saying those that are on milk are still very unspiritual. Those that are uh, on solid food, they are the ones that are teaching the babes, the, the less spiritual, to grow. And to continue to, to lift them up and to carry them on. And then he says that those on full solid food or full age or, or have come to uh, maturity. And then he talks about <clears throat> that those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Are you experiencing God's love? and God's ability in your life. You see, the more I experience Jesus, the stronger that I get because of the more I can trust Him with what He says. I can trust Him when He calls me to do something that is beyond my ability and yet wants me to do it because it's what He wants. And when we will follow Him, He will give you the power to do the things that you ought to be doing. You know, uh, and yet, when we, when we continue to use those things, when we continue to see those things happening, we grow stronger and stronger and stronger until we can continue in those things. All right? Uh, so exercise your faith. 
We are given a measure of faith, but we are to exercise that faith and let it grow stronger and bigger and more able to believe God for, for the difficult things, the impossible things that, that sometimes we have to pray for. Now, verse, now chapter 6, uh, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Now, what he's, he's still going on this line of that if you're just born again, you need to move from there. That was repentance. We have to repent before we can, we can meet Jesus. And repent means to turn around. Realize that we are sinners. Realize we're not good enough. Uh, and turn our faces towards Jesus and ask Him to forgive us of our sins. Uh, that's repentance. And that's the first basic element of the gospel that you and I need to not only experience, but also continue in. And there's six of these, and we will go through them uh, as they come. Um, repentance from dead works. I want you to understand, it took me a long time to understand what dead works really were. Um, dead works is anything that God's not in. As the Holy Spirit has wakened our spirit so that we can, can understand His Word, the things that we do when we help someone else, if we're doing that because, because God has given us the ability to do that and the love, His love for, for doing that, um, that is living works. Our faith is being exercised. Uh, but anything that we do that is not initiated by God, by the Holy Spirit, is just work. If we're just doing things just to be busy, it's dead work. And I want you to understand that it's real easy, even for pastors, to get busy doing so-called good things, but not the things that God has called us to do. So we need to be careful that we're not doing those dead works and we're starting doing those live works. And because I'm running out of time here, uh, I want you to understand, allow God to show you where you need to go. You can't touch every need, but if you will touch the one that He has put on your heart to touch, those are good works. They're not dead works because He is initiating you to do it. If it's to talk to someone and tell them about Jesus, that's a good work and God initiated it and it's part of His will. But as I'm, I'm, I'm closing up here, uh, I'll catch you next week on the rest of this and open it up even more for you. I want you to know that God loves you and we love you. And we're trying to be right about what we're doing to teach you what God wants. Thank you.